Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast, the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT to discuss their lives, their journeys and their ambitions with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. And as you can tell, we're still in Lee Johnston's... Why don't we title them as Lee's living room? Lee's living room. Yeah, Lee's living room. That's I was going to say it. front room, but yeah, living room. So just to, uh, to preface that and give it some context, you might hear some noises throughout the podcasts because it's a living space, it's a living area. And Lee's family have arrived and joined us, haven't they? There's a five-year-old jumping on the roof upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if, uh, if you do hear a, a few little noises, that's, that's all it is. It's a living, breathing organism, this podcast, isn't it? And sometimes you have to deal with the, uh, the outside noise. Adapt and overcome. Adapt and overcome, which is, which is one thing that this man had to do <laughs> all the time, eh? What a segue. 11 uh, times TT winner. Yeah, but that's... Li- a little portion of his <laughs> ethos of Philip McCallum, a thousand percent. A thousand percent Philip McCallum. He is that. He's intense. I reckon if you Googled a thousand percent. His face will pop up. Yeah. <laughs> but you see, the thing with Philip is I've only ever known him as a retired rider. I knew that he raced, but never really spent that much time watching him. For this podcast, did a bit of research. Man, the man's aggressive. What one word would one word would pop to your mind? Aggressive. Commitment. Commitment. Yes, he is not afraid of commitment. Yeah, it's he, funny, like he I, doesn't have commitment issues. Yeah, that is the one thing that everyone seems to refer to is his aggression, commitment, and intensity as a as a. But you can see it in him now, even as a person. Mm-hmm. I don't know how old is he. Fifty. That's yeah. Let's let's be kind to him. Fifty. Yeah, the man. You still wouldn't. Put your life savings on him not to have a go at trying to win. Oh, not at all. Or the fact that he probably thinks that he would have a... A crack at it. Oh, yeah. Right, well, well let's get him on. Let's stop chatting because, you know, he does like to have a chat as well. Philip McCallum, on his way. Right after this thing. We're in TT royalty. Uh, what's the word? What's the word I'm looking for? Matt, what's the word I'm looking for? Company. Company. Territory, company, <laughs> company. No, we're in uh, we're in company of a, a TT legend. Yes, but that that sort of narrows it down to one thing because he was good at more things than the TT as well. So I'd say I'd say road racing. All right, fair. But this is not the Ulster Grand Prix podcast, is it? I know, but it's not the Irish road racing podcast. Yeah, but that's where we're all from. Oh, you're not from there. No, he doesn't understand. <laughs> he doesn't does understand. He? <laughs> I wouldn't expect you to understand. But before this is over, we'd add you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, t- before we get onto your amazing record at Irish road racing, let's talk about Lee's Irish road racing record. Then, if you're so good at it, mate, tell I haven't me about done it. Any. <laughs> yeah. So shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I watched. That counts. All right, fair. How many Irish road races have you been to and watched? Um, Scaries, Tandragee. Cookstown. You're just naming places you know. You've <laughs> never even been there. Dublin Road Race. <laughs> Is it, was the one at Dublin? No. Oh. Anyway. It's close. It's too cl- close to cl- it. Skies yeah. and Keller Lane. They're yeah. just up the road a bit. Yeah. So. I'm going to learn. It's an education along the way, right? Yeah. yeah. But I'm sure the most important thing and the thing you'll take to your grave is 11 TT wins, right? That's. Yeah, it was... Um, it was good. It was brilliant. You know what I mean? It's only now you look back. At the time, it was just a job. You know, this is a job we're doing. This is a job you're doing and you love it. But when you look back, it's history. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's only then you look back and say, wow, we, you know. I was running yesterday for a parade lap and it was like, oh my God, this is too fast. And <laughs> and the, the truth is, I said to the boys afterwards, my eyes can't tell my brain fast enough now what's happening. I know what corner's coming. I know where it should be. But this translation between the eyes and the brain isn't fast enough and it's like anyone the first time you've done 150 or 160 miles an hour your brain has to adjust and my poor brain hasn't done this for <laughs> a lot of years so I was like oh my goodness you're confusing man other sort of senior writers who are telling the truth will tell the same you know and some of the guys said they're actually going a bit too fast for their focus and uh, I was probably going real slow yesterday, but I didn't care. You know, I just, I wanted to ride around. I wanted to be safe. I wanted to enjoy it and ride without worrying, you know. So that's why I was going yeah. slow. How long is it since you last did a lap? You do a lap in the bus and stuff most years, don't yes, you? Yes, I do. I do like a lap s- But on the, on the bike, when's the it, last period? It must lap? have been maybe 2018 or 2019. Yeah, so quite a few. Well, it's four or five years at least. Yes. Does it, yeah. was there anywhere you got to yesterday and like a, uh, Obviously, the tarmac's team. I even noticed from I went round yesterday to to when the last time I rode, which is only a year ago. But 
is there any bits you get to not that you don't remember where to go but you go oh that's different or the, the biggest stuff that scared me <laughs> <laughs> was the, the, the fast corners yeah you know because you can't uh, I hurt this arm a few weeks ago too, so I just haven't got the full strength to rip a bike apart either, and I'm not 22 anymore, you know. <laughs> so it's a bit like riding, a, you know, a, a custom bike on the road. You you line the corner way up in advance, and you go around it. Well, that's what I was doing yesterday. So I didn't even, I wasn't even looking at the surface. I was looking at <laughs> where I was on the road, you know. And one eye was sort of checking. There's dry lines, okay. Yeah. And the other leg, but no, the, the biggest stuff that I have to be so careful is when you get you know the hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty, hundred and forty. Yeah. Well, you boys, one hundred and eighty, me, one hundred and fifty. Yeah. Yesterday was you must get, you can't just decide to pull this bike at the last minute. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's where I was being over cautious. But I didn't, I didn't mind because I wanted to enjoy that lap <coughs> yesterday. And you know, you've done race laps where you shouldn't say this, but you've. You know, not, you have never scared yourself or you wouldn't do it, but you yeah. know, wow, that was... So I didn't want a lap like that. I wanted to look, I wanted to see and enjoy the the ride, and that's what I'd done. But, you know, definitely the focus, <laughs> you'd need quite a few laps or a few high-speed stuff to get your focus going again. And uh, the course was just the same, really, as you know. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all <coughs> the same, but it's making sure you're in the right place at the right time. Yeah, plus you were on a bike that a lot of people would... Do a lot to, to get a go on a, a factory RC forty five. Do you know what I mean? That's and for even now when I went out to listen to, to hear that bike, it, it means so much to people. Like when we brought it last year, the last time it was here, it was with you guys, or you know when yes. it was when it came properly. So it sounds like nothing else. There's no other bikes that, that you know you can if even if you didn't know a lot about racing, you could tell that thing coming. So that will have meant a lot to people to see you on that bike. Yeah, the amount of messages last yeah. night I got and the amount of stuff. And I was going slow enough I could wave <laughs> to people, you know. <laughs> and all, but afraid to lift my hand off the yeah. bar, you know. But, uh, it, no, it was good and you could hear it. And you wanted to play with it more, you know. And that bike just wants to, you know, the bike was far, far too good for me. I remember in my racing days along the mountain mile, you were screwing the neck off it looking more, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yesterday I was, was afraid to rev it. But even, you know, you go along the mountain mile and the places you get it in, the fifth and sixth gear just for one it just wants to keep pulling yeah. not, not like a modern super yeah, bike, of course but this v4 wants to keep on pulling yeah. you know and i'm going no slow down girl <laughs> you know <laughs> and, uh, you know the end of the mountain mile used to just lie into that oh, and, yeah. and to go this and i'm going where is it <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, like a brilliant experience yesterday but an experience like i've never had in my life before where this brain isn't working fast enough you know the uh, it happens to lots of yeah. people, but I haven't experienced that in years. It happens to me every day, every <laughs> single day, even in the car. So for those of those people that are listening or watching, um, I said I guess we should context that by the fact that we're at the Manx GP. There was a, a a made in the Manx, a made in Manx parade lap where there was all sorts of bikes, all sorts of riders going off. Brian Reed was there, Charlie Williams was there, Philip yourself was there. Um, but the question we always ask on the podcast, and you might have felt it a bit yesterday in that parade lap is rolling up to the start line. We always ask the same question to all the riders, past and present. Rolling up to that start line, getting that guy, grabbing you on the shoulder. And I presume you still had someone back in the back oh, in the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the 80s. Always we yeah. tap. Yeah. We tap on the shoulder. Yeah. How does it feel to get that? It's When you get older, you boys aren't old enough yet, but uh, <laughs> when you get older, you, you, you sort of there. you get... You, the sort of the the nerves and all there's none of that you know what i mean it's but sort of the excitement is like you're really reminiscing you're you're reliving your youth you know like you know the last time i took off down bray hill and he tapped me in the shoulder i wanted to win mm-hmm. you know was this was far far less pressure i just wanted to ride down bray hill and i had some people giving off it goes like you're you'd put four gears in before you reach the bottom <laughs> of, but i don't want to damage that wee bike you yeah. know what i mean it's like that bike is pure history you know it's a double tt winning bike you know it's only complete competed in four races in his whole life that bike you know two northwest and two uh, tt so uh, i don't want to damage that bike and but it just it was the thrill of riding it again and going down bray hill i'm halfway down bray hill and <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> you know yeah. and what happens at the bottom because you know say back in the days you just drove that as fast as you could it just 
sunk into there and you got the gas back on you're trying to line up Ego Sleep yeah. you know and so th there was none of that <laughs> yesterday I'm, I'm thinking what's happening what's going to do and then you know Dennis who looks after that bike he, you know it's, it's stripped and it's rebuilt and oh, everything's yeah. perfect before it goes out again so you don't have to worry a lot of people in the classic stuff worry about something falling off the bike or something not right so there was none of that it was just like ride it and enjoy it and I'm trying to get breaking points and you're coming down to Quarter Bridge and you're going well I'm breaking too early I mean, it's <laughs> like, there's all there is all these calculations going on and what I can compare it to a little bit is in the modern GP stuff you see you heard the older riders talking about the electronics now and you've got to hit a button when you come to start and you hit a button coming out of corners and you hit a button to yeah. change this and do this that's your modern technology riding the bike well i was trying to get back to the old stuff you know i'm going 150 miles an hour here where do i break where do i stop I because your eyes again can't tell the brain you know we do it natural in our yeah. race day you just in you're on and that's it but you go <laughs> and the second that you have to do that when you're racing is like you know, you shouldn't have to second guess. Yeah. No, nothing. So, so this is brilliant. It's like, uh, I can compare it to that. It's trying to work it all out. Can you still, when you rolled up yesterday to the start line, at any point could you feel, because you, you're you well known for being an intense rider yeah. when you were when you were racing. It's a, it's a, it's a known yeah. fact, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. No, it's, so c can you remember like what it felt like when you were walking because did you did they always go off single or at certain times there was two, there we was had doubles use a double so in the early you, days like did you ever by off chance be setting off with someone that was a genuine thing person to be setting off with that was maybe in for the win and you would eyeball them or have you ever done anything like that there where you looked at people or have you not so much here you yeah. know what i mean because you were so focused on like Bray Hill, you were so focused yeah. getting off the line, you know, in the first, St. Ninians is your first yeah. thought, isn't it? So not really at the TT, at the Northwest and all those multi-start stuff, yeah, you can just look down the line. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and and when someone, I remember in the Northwest doing it two or three times, you know, and you just look over and you could just see, I'm not going to say who they were, looking back and you could just see them on got no chance <laughs> oh no yeah <laughs> you know and th so some writers you see it can be intimidated yeah. real easy like that yeah you know you just yes <laughs> and, and did you did uh, you suffer with nerves bad or or no uh, i don't think so to be honest i would need my close close people to tell me but i don't think so because i always what i tried to do in racing and i see people and you watch it in in every you know I, I watch it every week in world superbikes and moto gp you know a lot of them boys are getting into a zone you know maybe an hour before the race i don't think i done that i'd need my close friends to tell me but i remember just talking to people on the line talking to people signing autographs going up to the thing not a problem you know and what i always tried to do because i've done a lot of work in my early days with sports psychologists you know when that wasn't heard of and uh it was just you save all that energy for when that flag drops yeah. if you're burning the mind an hour before it you just you're wasting energy you're wasting time you're wasting everything so just let the whole thing keep normal let the body be normal as you can let everything and then whatever five seconds ten seconds one minute before it right that's it we focus now and a lot of sort of my opposition and my dad sort of thought, you know, well, I was a nice guy in the pot. I could lend you things that help you. But <laughs> He's trying to convince us <laughs> there <laughs> or himself. I don't know. <laughs> but when that flag goes down, yeah. you're not my mate anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're all, we're going seriously here for our wages. It's, you know, it's like you're, you're competing against other people for the job you take part in sport. And, you know, you have to do a better job if you want that job. And, and motorcycling is very competitive, as you know. And, and there is only so much prize money. There is only so many commentators needed. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people looking at that prize money. So, you know, at the Northwest in, in those days, there's maybe 15 people all reckon they could win. Yeah. You know, they're looking at money. And it was like, you know, you had some tough, tough guys, you know, the Jim Moody's and, the, you know, all those boys of the world. They're, they're tough riders, yeah. Dave Leach and... You know, those boys are all tough, tough riders. And them boys rode in European stuff and all back then and British stuff that I didn't ride in. So I had a, a lot of catching up and work to do if you wanted to beat those boys. Yeah. What I love is I've only known Philip since doing yeah. the podcast and doing a bit of the TT. And to speak to him and chat to you now, mellow, chilled. I, I'll speak to Plato. I'll speak to literally anybody else. And they say, once you're on a bike, you are, you're a different animal. <laughs> and when you start looking at clips and you start watching clips from old uh, Irish road races or the TT 
Yeah, but he might have been. He might have been your friend in the pits, but <laughs> yeah. he definitely was not. Yeah, but he, everyone like, says like, one like, of the, like the, the said, though, competitors. The people, it's so easy for people in a no, not a normal job, but in a normal nine to five job, to go, "Oh, you're so lucky to do what you do," mm-hmm. and then. People have no idea of a the pressure, b getting sacked every year. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because you pretty much yeah. do get sacked every not sacked, but <laughs> yeah, you don't have a job. You don't have a job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Until you pr- so you imagine all them days that you go to work and go, I'm not feeling it today. The, you, if you're at the Northwest, you're at the TT, you're at the Ulster Grand Prix, you're at British Championship and everything. No matter how bad the weather is, what way you're feeling or anything, you literally go, it, you know, you, you have to, you know, perform because. Yeah. That is, there's only so many days to to get your accreditation for getting your job the following year, and then trying to keep your wages, trying to keep your bonuses, everything relies on performance all the time, and, and everyone can your last see, race, really. yeah. yeah, and everything you're doing, everybody can see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's like you can't sit in the back of the office out of the way with the hangover <laughs> going, not today, lads. You know, just don't, just don't worry. You can't sit at the back of the grid and go, oh, I'll let you go yeah. for this one. Because you'll be out of a job. You're out of a job. Yeah. yeah. So where did that come? Oh. Where did that come from? Where did that 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 competitive? And yeah. it's, it's I've seen people with competitive edges, but yours is. I, I think it, it was another level about money. Really, it was about like I was a country boy brought up, and we were brought up in a in a. a my granda had a farm, and he had a grocery shop, and so we were brought up to work. From like I was five years old, I was delivering milk. You know, mm-hmm. we also had a, we had a post office and a grocery shop, and we had a, back in the days we had two milk lorries or three milk lorries, and we had a grocery van for the people that remember them. So I was always brought up to work. You know, we had to when we were young help pack the vans. You know, we delivered milk. You know, from your we fibers, from your old enough to walk and carry milk, you delivered it. You know, mm-hmm. and even up until I was like twenty years old, I used to do a Sunday or every other Sunday to help my uncle uh, have a day off on a Sunday. You know, so I was working and in life, but I still felt my duty was to help the family where I could. So, and you're always taught to do it right. You know, mm-hmm. if you delivered milk, you sat it on the door, you sat it where it was supposed to be. You know, on a Friday, we actually used to be quite good at mass and all because you collected money on a Friday or a Saturday. Yeah. You know, so you had somebody with you know three pints every day and four on a Saturday and five on a Sunday, and it was thirteen and a half p a pint. You know, that's, <laughs> that's some counting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So everything you were just learned that you were just taught to do the best you can out. So mm-hmm. and in my job, you know, I'd started off as an apprentice engineer. I'm gonna say I'm a good engineer, stainless steel, aluminium fabrication and mechanical engineer, and that was my job, but I can still do today. And um but you do it right. You know, an engineer is different to other people. An engineer he gets a piece of material and he makes it into something and then he presents it into something and then he he sells it you know so there's a process Mm -hmm. and so if you engineering type people and that that's what they do with their whole life some people sort of you know they paint a wall and they do a bit up there and they do a bit down there and they do it but what's the pattern what's there's no pattern to that there's no root root to that so engineers are are (laughs) renowned for being hard to deal with as well because it is either right or it's not. Yeah. It? That's fact, isn't it? So sometimes mm. even if you have engineers that try to go into another trade, whether it be the building trade or whatever, where you know levels and stuff are not always right, yeah, they yeah. can't they can't <laughs> cope with. Would so been out? yeah, would would you have brought that to race? And then do you yes, think no? Yeah. Would you have been aw- not yes. awkward in a sense because you it was either everything had we had to have it right. Yeah. And the trouble is when you're an engineer and you understand metal and all that stuff. You basically, you can make anything, right? Every single thing can be made or can be made better or done better, you know? So, yeah, that's what I'd done with my bikes right from the start. You know, I could, like, I'm an aluminium welder, which, you know, there isn't many no. of those around today, but that's, like, in... Pff, my God, I don't even think. That's in the <laughs> mid-80s. That's, that's... What's that? That's, that's 40 years ago. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, 40 years ago... Uh, aluminium frames were only coming in. There was, you know, steel frames and stuff. So when anything happened to my frames, I could bring them into work and weld them, yeah. you know. And then other people would look you to do that for them. And I did, I did help other people and do that. So it was just to make that better. And and then I've always been like an R and D writer with every single company right from the start. And you know, so I've worked with you know Bridgestone. I've worked with Mitch Michelin. I've never done much with Dunlop, but 
you know, those sort of people in tire development. And I've worked with all the brake people, you know, the EBC people, the uh, Brambo people. I've tested products for those. I've worked with all the suspension people. You know, I worked with uh, Kiaba stuff back in the Honda days. Mm -hmm. I worked with Olin's. I used to work with good old K-Tech in my early days when, when Ken had his transit van at Donington <laughs> Park, you know, in the early 90s. Well, you know, I worked with Ken Somerton, yeah. who's now a famous, famous man yeah. in suspension, you the know. The company's now, is, um, I don't know if you've been over in a while, but I went this year and I hadn't been for two or three years and the company is massive you know the all the, the amount of five or six really big industrial units where it mm -hmm. was like one and a small yeah, shed yeah. and the desk was in the corner yeah you know and so really part of my whole race and stuff i nearly enjoyed this isn't totally true you know i enjoyed the development on the metal and how it all worked so I got my sort of thrill out of making that part of it right. And I enjoyed being a like a test writer for all of those products. And because road racing meant a lot, you know, more years ago than it does now. And there was a, a good, really, uh, there was a, a route between the parts we tried until the parts that that manufacturer put on the road a few years later, you know. Now, that's all changed now. Yeah, today. No, it's, it's modern technology, not. But so it was good to be part of all that coming through and understood it and, um loads and loads I could talk about there but that just taught me that the better my bike was you know the better my bike was the easier my job was mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. and that's, so I wanted an easy job you know I loved the riding and I wanted to win but I wanted to do it as easy as Make I it could as possible yeah you know and then you know but then when you have to dig deep right you just dig deep you know and you ride harder and it's you know I've like was talking about there you know in 90 <coughs> in 95 when I won, I had a deal with Honda in 95. I was doing World Thunder Bikes. So I was in that first group of 600s that went into GP racing back mm -hmm. then. And I wanted to go on that route because I did want to, I think if I would have concentrated, I could have been a good circuit rider. You know, I've been up there at the start of the seasons and in, in the uh, Super Sports 600 and stuff, leading that and winning races and sort of 96, 97 stuff. And... Um, the other thing also as part of that, th there's really three parts of that we can talk all over the place, but you know, so if you were mechanically fit, I call that, and then if you were mentally fit, right, mm -hmm. and then there's physically fit, so if you're mentally fit, you're physically fit, your bike's mechanically fit, that puts you well up the packing yeah. order. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what yeah. I mean? Because you've seen the boys. Especially in that time when, you know, bikes breaking down and things yeah. were a lot more, like nowadays, a, a, a modern super stock bike is pretty, it's 10 chances proof. to one it will literally be an electrical problem or a, you know something yes, like that yeah. now more than if you took the anti-wheelie traction and wheel speed sensors and stuff off a modern super stock bike You'd it would no ride around here all day pretty much yes, you know yeah, if, yeah. unless something came loose but that was to do with having a good team and back in phillips yeah. day it was a lot more common for Yes, mechanical components yeah, to yeah, break. Components yeah. To and break and so my bikes you know i didn't i don't think really i've had ever any breakdowns or maybe minute if it was or minute something falling off a bike or something and uh, that already you know put you right up in the, in yeah, the top your chances group, you yeah. know and then you had to be mentally ready which is easy you know if you're into that right it's easy yeah <laughs> it's a thousand percent or nothing mm -hmm. you know and yeah there is no 90s yeah you know what i mean and i've talked to writers actually i'm not even going to say their names but they would talk about riding around the tt and losing concentration and i'm thinking like good people yeah, how could how? you possibly yeah. you can see that lose? maybe if the there were the bike wasn't good and they had no chance, do you know what I mean? But yes. that obviously wasn't ever your case, do you know what I mean? If, if, no. they were, if they were just trying to get back or something, you know, so they didn't yes. get stuck out yeah. on track, then there's a chance of that. But when you're absolutely on the rivet yeah. and, you know, racing... That, and with a chance of... Yeah, the, I don't yeah, know yeah. how that would ever happen. No, no neither do I. And it's... It's yes, back to the old working principle we talked about at the start. If you're going to do the job, do it right. Yeah. yeah. Do it the best you can. You know, because the other people are doing it the best they can. And like you're doing, you're looking, you, you do it every week. We all do. You assess other commentators and how they're doing the job and present yeah. and all the rest. And we do the same in racing. You know, like what's his team, what's his bike, what his stuff. And, you know, I remember Joey, who's like one of the, the toughest man to beat in his day. But I studied that man so much. You know, <laughs> he was a friend of mine. And 
I don't mean looking back on it now. I studied them, but I thought that was what you'd done then. So I looked at what Joey was strong at, what he was weak at, what he could do, what he and I think we had a good relationship, him and I, and he was he was a friend of mine too. But he also knew what I was doing. You know, he knew we would have races and say it was an Ulster Grand Prix and there was five races in a day, you know, well, and he done the exact same with David Jackson. Yeah, he did, you know, <laughs> right to uh, say. So <laughs> but you could be fooled, because everyone looked yeah. at him and thought it was this pleasant little man, mm. old man at the time even. Mm. Was he, but I think anybody that, well, you don't become really good at anything without being savvy and yeah. calculated and, mm -hmm. you know, trying really hard. And it, it starts with him saying, you do all as much as you can outside of riding the bike to make the bike easier yeah. so whether that's figuring out who is good at one part of the track whose tires are better when it's oh, certain doing, conditions yeah. you, you, if you know all that there you're it, if there ever was a case of knowledge as wealth it's you know yeah. what i mean that is the yeah the, the biggest thing and what's different than i and that it's i laugh about it because we will keep going back and back to it you know our head back then we didn't have calculators we didn't have sorry calculators we didn't have transponders yeah yeah, you know, yeah we didn't have you know communication we didn't have data on suspension we didn't yeah, have it was down nothing. to the writer so you had to work all that out in your head you know so when i'd come back in i'd have to remember every single thing about that bike to tell the boys mm -hmm. and i always had a good team that would take that out dennis who's with me here yesterday yeah. and riding you know he could read my mind he could know exactly i could tell him what was what and then we would fix it and do it yeah. all that's a very uh, important relationship that not a lot of people like philip might say something in a certain tone he might come in like irate to his crew chief which is mm -hmm. dennis and and if that was someone that didn't understand philip they might think it's a big problem mm -hmm. but it might not be a big problem maybe just that philip's excited and everything so rather than make a big change dennis might make a little he change trans, and that is trans it, it, it is yeah. being a people yeah. that is such a crucial job and, that people that was, don't understand like, you know dennis worked hard we were careful we say here but foggy <laughs> right <laughs> good old foggy you know dennis was you know foggy's crew chief and man years ago in honda and when they finished in that suzuka race and the early 90s him and hezzy finished third in the suzuki at r you know dennis was the man that built those bikes in hrc so dennis has a lot of knowledge yeah. and a lot of mm. stuff but dennis and i became friends in 1989 when i joined honda uh, with good old tuxworth and uh, uh you can say whatever you want about neil now he's not there anymore so it's it's, it's free will i'm not gonna do that but, uh, you know, so I became friends with Dennis pretty good, but Dennis also used me back then because he was Foggy's man. We had RC 30s, and when I joined, first of all, we were doing the idea was Joey was slowing down, and there wasn't many road racers left in the world. And Honda F1 was still a world championship back then, and then in '90 it changed to a world round or something. But so we had RC 30s, and basically they were all the same. But Foggy was some rider, but he wasn't very good at. He could ride so the bike. He could ride the bike, but you know this thing could be going every shape. Foggy still be riding it because he just he could ride and he could yeah. do anything. But Dennis used to take a lot of settings and a lot of but Foggy couldn't tell him. Yeah. You know, so Dennis used to take a lot of settings out of my bike and my stuff because I'm an engineer. I'm working it all out. Obviously, he must have been a slightly better rider than me, Foggy, in those days. <laughs> but uh, and he would put my stuff into Foggy's bike and Foggy would go faster. You know what I mean? Go, well, so it worked for everybody, basically. <laughs> it worked he for was, everyone, yeah. you know, and, and, and that was that communication you're talking about. Now we've got computers to do that stuff. But you had to do that in your head back then. And, and as I get older and see this, I can relate, and me telling you now, you can relate to this. Yeah. You know, you had to do all that yourself. And now, you know, I, you know, Dennis's son, he's with Aprilia at the yeah, moment. Yeah. He's with the Yamaha factory team, and now he's with the Aprilia boys. Yeah. And the, the stuff, like tires only work now between, you know, that temperature, temperature. and that mm -hmm. temperature. They only work between that stuff. You know, you've got to do all the buttons. And, you know, he's one of the lads that's telling me about the older riders riding the modern GP bike. They can't do it. No. Because there is, it, this thing is like a PlayStation. Yeah. It's, it's the, quite a common thing. I don't know if anybody's seen the interview, but Casey Stoner was at goodwood uh, festival of speed and he is an ambassador for ducati which is the most technically leading bike in mm -hmm. grand prix at the minute and casey openly says they've they've killed it they've basically took the percentage away so it was a known fact that 
motorbikes compared to cars or the rider to the driver say on a motorbike it's 80 20 you know how much because the, the rider how much input yeah the your weight transfer one, yeah. everything turns the bike whereas in formula one it might have been 30 70 the other way around the, to car, the car to the yeah. driver you know what i mean and, and casey was adamant that they've took the percentage off the rider's input because of the wings the aero the downforce you know yeah. all these things and, yeah. and he he wants it to go back which i think is a is a fair point you know what i mean will they but ever go back now no it's hard because ducati suffered for that many years and now <laughs> yeah. they've come good they can't literally do all that work and go yeah. you know it's not that's not fair either mm-hmm. but you can see yeah. you know the older generation's point and even i i think the the better the more natural the bike the better for yeah for the rider yeah it is you know because it's the rider input yeah. you know this is the traction control not now sure they've got yeah. blippers every corner yeah. has to be programmed every and you can see it when it goes wrong in the bike yeah. the rider just goes whomp yeah to the back yeah I, and it's it. funny my because when i was what sitting at home watching the tt this year Peter Hickman set off, I don't know if it was the first superbike race or the superstock race, and literally by the time he got to quarter bridge, I went, oh, his blipper's not working. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I spotted it, like, because it was something yeah. that I, my brain would know to look for. Yeah. But maybe the comment, you know, whoever was coming, you, you wouldn't think that because yeah. the, it's not in their brain. But as soon as I seen him using the clutch, going down the gear, I was like, why is he doing that? Yeah. It was because the blipper stopped. And then once they got to the pits, turned it off, turned it on again, it reset itself and then it worked. Do you know what I mean? So... And that's a big when you're riding with that and someone takes it off you. Yeah. Do you know, even back yeah. when you use like quick shifters oh, and yeah. stuff, you go back to every time you have to change, you know, closing <laughs> open and closing the throttle. Yeah. It's a massive thing. Somebody had that in World Superbike, didn't they? One Johnny the Ray. Johnny Ray, yes, yeah, in yes. the wet in yeah. wet oh, race recently, in Phillip yeah. Island, yeah. He would have well, I'd say he would have won the race, but in, in the wet it makes an like, even bigger difference because of the sensitivity of the yeah. you know losing track. It's unbelievable like how he done that yeah, with, adapted. You know, but but Johnny don't forget he's old school yeah, among the young boys. Yeah, he rides you know, the bike. He's back from riding his motocross bikes and you know, yeah. riding them ten kit Hondas and you yeah. know, where you had to physically ride it, you know, whereas them other boys have been more in the electronics, you know, yeah. uh stuff. So some people can ad- adapt and adjust and some can't, you know? So a question I, I wondered, and, and we're just going back probably down the conversation a little bit here. When you were saying how, how much of an R&D rider you were, so research and development, back in the day, how much information did the manufacturers take from what we'd find from the TT and actually implement that into a, a road-going version of a bike? Did that happen much or, or not? It, it, it sort of did in those days, and I was very, very lucky. You know, one of my jobs offered to me when... I was always going to stop racing. That was always because I was never going to be one of those. Happens to everyone, Philip, yeah. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, you know, but I was always going to one day just stop racing. Right. You know, I loved racing. I'd had my period at it. You know, whenever you look at the, all the law averages and the stats and all which engineers do and all this stuff, right, this can't go on forever. You know, to ride on that edge, to win races, you've got a period. You've got your, whatever it is, five years, ten years, and you are on the edge in road racing you're on the edge all the time to win all those races you're on the edge you know i heard these manx older people talking about 90 percent riding and 95 percent riding you know. i think i think it's also different when when you are that competitive like philip's got no interest in turning up for the sake of being here yeah do you know what i mean and like i i am exactly the same myself <laughs> but it's different you know if if somebody that has been a a uh, competitor not a winner you know they've come and finished yeah. 10th and 15th and they enjoy riding their bike they can do it a lot longer i believe yes because yeah. they're never they're never having to change their mindset but it's like you imagine winning 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 yeah. and then turning up and being fifth and eighth and fifth and tenth you are putting the same effort in the same the same risk cost, if, not, yeah. if not more yeah. cost yeah. everything plus you're not getting paid as much because you're not winning yeah so yeah, it's, yeah. it's an it's a net that's a massive negative Whereas for someone that's, yeah, this what is no disrespect to someone that is riding around because they're they're able to enjoy that they get as much out of it they're not out any more money they're not you know what I mean all these yeah. factors are it's a completely different yeah. even though it's the same track and the same thing it's a completely yeah. different way of looking at yeah. it. so and when he when you say about you were going to quit that's what he means he was like the, I was going to stop yeah. what I wanted to do to be honest now like all my people know I've won five Northwests in a day I've won five all these are the big road yeah. races I've won five uh, Northwest I've won five Ulster Grand Prix in a day I wanted to win five TTs in a week mm-hmm. that's yeah. and the day I would have won that that was it I was just going to stand up on Friday and say that's it it's all over I'm done I'm done You know. could, could you have done uh, that could you have walked away at that yeah point? I could have had because 
like I say, I'm a good engineer, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, my plan was anyway with my old boss and old company that I was coming back to engineering. I was going away for like 10 years from the early 90s to the 2000s to be based in England with Honda, with whatever, and uh, come back in 10 years' time back into engineering. That was my plan in life to mm-hmm. do that. And uh, so there was no problem. I, a lot of people who racing is their livelihood, you know, they don't, you have other skills, yeah, yeah. you know, so if you stop racing tomorrow, you're not going to starve. No. You know, you, you I think know, it's, it's, uh, it's funny now because it was more common back then that lads did graft and especially with road racers, it was, you're more of a common breed, whereas now in British Championship, kids come in and they've, they've never really worked. The parents pay for a rent. It's like, they get to like third. Oh, sorry. All right, the door's just gone. That's Lee's mum to pick up the family. So while Lee's mum's here, we'll take a break from this podcast. Join us in part two, because Philip has still got this to say. Five in a week, and you said you would have quit. But you almost got there. We did four in a week. First person ever. It's only right that we talk about some TT. We've not actually touched on much of your TT career. So your first question is to irritate him. <laughs> That, that's a that's a nice start. Well, we can, the one thing that really pisses him off. You're going to ask him the well, first, yeah, co- yeah, the first yeah. question. Why, yeah. And then, and then yeah. Hutchie goes along a few years later yeah. and gets a five. And yeah. but, well, hey, you said that. I didn't, I didn't should we just that. talk but, about Hutchie then, just to make it really? <laughs> well, we'll get onto that later. Hutchie's a good guy too. <laughs> that episode is coming up next week, right here on TT Plus or on YouTube. You might be watching it right there, and if you are, you can always leave your comments down below. I'm looking forward to that one. But until then, go and get your tea, Lee. It's been emotional.